Ian's second question and the last question of the episode is, in a related matter, there is Matthew 12. Jesus' comment concerning the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. The comment sprang from the Pharisees questioning Jesus' ability to drive out demons. Are the two related? Why is blaspheming the Holy Spirit beyond forgiveness? Well, let me let me begin this by two sort of summary thoughts or summary ideas, and then I'll I'll unpack these a little bit. In the Gospels, the exorcism of demons, the casting out of demons, is also associated. They're 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 two sides of the same coin, with the presence and the advance of the kingdom of God. You know, notice. In, let's just go to. Matthew 12 in verse 28, you have this this link specifically noted. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So that's actually a common idea in the Gospels when Jesus is casting out demons. It has something to do with the kingdom of God being present or taking form or advancing. Again, there's a lot of ways to describe that. The second summative thought is that blaspheming the Holy Spirit is assigning the works of God to Satan. Again, that's pretty clear from the passage. That is, by implication, a rejection of the kingdom of God. If you're, if you're assigning the works of God to Satan, then you're assigning God's kingdom to Satan. You're, you're rejecting the kingdom of God. So th- those are two sort of things to have in your head you know, as we discuss this. Now, for this one, let me just open up what's probably my favorite commentary on, on uh, Matthew by R.T. France. And he says, he says, the saying about an unforgivable sin has often been inappropriately and sometimes disastrously applied to contexts which have little to do with its original setting. As it appears here in Matthew, it is specifically concerned with what the Pharisees have just said. In Matthew 9, 3, the the scribes had accused Jesus of blasphemy. Now the charge returns. The opening in verse 31, therefore, and I'll I'll just read you the verse, therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. So back to France. The opening, therefore, indicates that in this context, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is to be understood in terms of the Pharisees' charge in verse 24, attributing what is in fact the work of God's Spirit to his ultimate enemy, Satan. It is thus a complete perversion of spiritual values, revealing a decisive choice of the wrong side in the battle between good and evil, between God and Satan. It is this which has shown these Pharisees to be decisively against Jesus. That's verse 30. And it is this diametrical opposition to the good purpose of God, which is ultimately unforgivable. It is beside the point to question whether any worse sin could be imagined. The point is that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit stands out from the run of quote-unquote ordinary sins as being uniquely serious. It is to declare oneself against God. It is to call evil good and good evil. Now, just getting away from France a little bit, I think it might be helpful to think about this issue In terms of an illustration, a couple of illustrations that come from the Old Testament, and what I have in mind here is the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, and I think importantly, Old Testament laws where there was no provision for forgiveness in the sacrificial system for certain offenses. Now, we went through Leviticus, and you know that, again, depending on the translation, some of them, it's rendered in different ways, but there are these sins that are committed with a high hand or again, these, these intentional sins. One of them was actually blasphemy against God. Now, there were no sacrifices to take care of these sorts of sins. There was just the death penalty. In other words, there, there was nothing you could do to sort of make this go away. If you remember back in our series on Leviticus, there, there were certain sins like this. So I think that needs to be part of the backdrop with this this passage and this whole issue. Because again, if you're thinking about the Old Testament, this, the language used here, think about the language that's used, will not be forgiven, will not be forgiven. That is the same phrase, except it's negated, that you'll find in the Old Testament about being forgiven. In other words, when the offer would bring a a sacrifice, Leviticus says, 
you know, 10, roughly a dozen, but 10 times or so, that he shall be forgiven. He shall be forgiven. Well, here it's the same phrase is negated in this Matthew 12 passage. So if you're someone like the Pharisees, and again, the initial readers here of Matthew, and again, Matthew is, quote unquote, the most Jewish gospel, and it is, and there are good reasons for saying that. When you hear this phrase, I think your mind, and their minds certainly, because basically the Pharisees have, have the whole Torah memorized, their mind is going to be taken back to these passages about sacrifices and forgiveness, and also the fact that there were certain sins that just didn't have a remedy. It, there was, it was a death penalty offense. In other words, if you commit this, this sin, you're done. If this is what you did. You're done. You know, you're, you're not gonna, there, there's nothing to do here. It, the effect of it's going to be eternal because you're going to be dead. Now, I would say, having said all that, the idea in Matthew 12 with the unpardonable sin is kind of, sort of threefold. I'll, let, me, let me give you three thoughts. The phrase, will not be forgiven, draws on Old Testament language about forgiveness in the sacrificial system. All right. Secondly, when you negate that idea, that is, a, is to be understood as a reference to the high-handed willful sin. In this instance, again, it's going to be equatable to the blasphemy against God himself. But in, in Matthew 12 specifically, it's rejecting the Messiah, of course, who is God incarnate. And that means it's rejecting the salvation of being a member of the kingdom of God. You reject it by saying, this person in front of me is empowered by Satan, and the kingdom he's talking about is the kingdom of Satan. And third, if this is where a person's heart is, then there's really no sacrifice or atonement for that person. He has been hardened, akin to the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Now, I would say the end of verse 32 is worth noting here. It says, whosoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. I'm going to go back to France here and pick up one, one statement he has toward the end of, of his little treatment here. He says, this age and the age to come are Jewish terms which apply primarily to the contrast between this life and the next, rather than to successive phases of life on earth here. In this instance, then, the consequences of the unforgivable sin apply not only to this life, but also to the life to come, when judgment shall have been fully given. Now, this is me talking now. In other words, if you are determined not to believe to the point where you'll call God's kingdom Satan's kingdom, and the power of the Spirit, the activity of Satan, then your fate is sealed. This is the sin that seals one's fate, not some moral violation. In other words, what's being described here is the full-on rejection of the person of Christ and, of course, therefore, the gospel. Think of it this way. If you reject the gospel, well, where else do you think you're going to go? What else do you think is going to happen? If you reject the gospel, then you're going to wind up in this life, because this is your state of mind, and in the next life, you will be in this status of being unforgiven. You will be alienated, separated from God forever. Now, the way I've, I've articulated that is sort of akin to Hebrews 6, this idea of there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. You know, if someone lapses into unbelief or doesn't believe the gospel. In other words, there's no alternative. There's no alternative solution. If someone rejects the work of Christ, there's no other means of salvation. So we're done. Now that doesn't preclude, and I think this is part of the, the, the lurking issue behind the question, this doesn't preclude a change of heart. If one repents and turns to the only means of salvation, realizing there's no other sacrifice for sin, then you're in the status of agreeing with God. You're in the status of accepting God's solution. Since there were Pharisees in the New Testament who later believed, according to the book of Acts, it seems pretty reasonable to me that this is the way to read the language of Matthew 12. You know, and I'll admit, we can't know for sure that the Pharisees who believe later on were present in this scene. But at one point, you know, the Pharisees were at the crucifixion, anyway, pretty, pretty much in lockstep, uh, rejecting the gospel, rejecting this person as, as you know, being the Messiah. So if one, you know, later on, has a change of heart. Well, then Scripture testifies to the fact that they could have a change of heart. If one later denies that the kingdom of God was the kingdom of Satan, if you deny that later on, 
And then, therefore, you affirm that Jesus was the Son of God, and he cast out demons through the Holy Spirit. In other words, he was what he said he was. Then you're actually embracing his Messiahship, which means you're embracing the gospel, which means you're agreeing with God, which means you have come to salvation. But if you're at this level of hardening, there is nothing else God will present to you for forgiveness. So if you're in this scene in Matthew 12, and you're looking at Jesus, and you're saying, look, you're, you're, you're basically like another Satan. You know, you're empowered by Satan. Your kingdom is Satan's kingdom. If that's where you're at, where, where you're at, and, and this person that you're assigning satanic status to is in fact the only way of salvation. You have to be a member of the kingdom of God, this kingdom you're rejecting, this kingdom that you're associating with Satan. If that's, the, if that's the situation, if that's the case, if you're at this level of hardening, there's nothing else that, that, that you can look to for forgiveness. There is nothing else God will pr- present to you for forgiveness. And that's going to have eternal ramifications. So unless you com- do a complete 180, unless you come to agree with God, if this is where you're at, there's just no other alternative. Your fate is sealed. Your destiny is sealed. And, it, and it's in this life because this is your present attitude. And if you don't come to agree with God, because again, remember, there's no other thing to do. There's nothing else that will rectify this situation spiritually other than for you to agree with God that this is his Messiah and that this is God's kingdom that he's representing. And it, it is by the power of, the, of God's Spirit that he's doing these things. Unless you come to that point, you will not have eternal life. You, you, there, there is no other, there's nothing else there. And so it's categorical. It has ramifications both for where you're at in this life, in your mind, and if that situation is never rectified, if you never come to agree with God, then it's also going to be sealed. Your fate is sealed in the life, you know, life to come, in the age to come. So I think we need to we need to be thinking about Matthew 12. Sort of try to hear it the way the Pharisees would have heard it. Um, again, taking their minds back to the language of forgiveness in the in their own sacrificial system, and then negating it, which would in turn bring their minds back to the fact that oh yeah, you know there 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 were unpardonable sins, or, or at least that there there that's using our language. There were sins in the Old Testament that had no solution. You know, you were damned. Uh, if you did this. And, and, and so if, if you're thinking like that and you're hearing, you know, what Jesus is saying, that is the ultimatum. Either you believe in this guy and that he is empowered by the spirit of God. And this is in fact, the kingdom of God, membership in the kingdom of God being presented to you. If you reject that, you're done. There's nothing else God can do or will do for you.